Uh, we're going to get on an airplane and go about five hours west to the great Pacific Northwest where my home is and uh, Martin is one of my neighbors. And so uh, will you please welcome to the podium here Martin Mango of Kerry Kopczynski and Company. Um, well, before I begin, I'd just like to um, point out that um, I think this slide really makes the case for the Pacific Northwest being regarded as one of the most beautiful areas in the world. But I'm uh, not going to biased or anything, I just wanted to point that out. At any rate, um, for all, all of you that are unfamiliar with the Pacific Northwest, it is located in the farthest reaches of the country and nestled between California and Canada, as you can see on this map. And um, despite uh, what may seem as an isolated location, the latest uh, U.S. Green Building Council statistics state that 11% um, of the uh, LEED certified projects within the country are located within the Pacific Northwest. Now, that may not seem as a, you know, a, a very impressive figure, but when we consider that only 4% of the population of the U.S. lives in the Pacific Northwest, that definitely makes these figures a little bit more meaningful. Now, more specifically, the, um, the, the latest uh, figures from the city of Seattle, this is as current as of uh, December 2006. Well, it's not as current as it should be, but that's, that's what we have. Uh, Seattle has the highest number of LEED certified buildings in the world. Now, it being a statistic, it also lends itself to, um, to time. So obviously, there are people out there that would disagree with this number, but remember, it's as of December 2006. Also, um, Seattle is, um, leads the nation in the, the number of accredited professionals for LEED, and also was the first U.S. city in the, um, in the nation to adopt a, a LEED-based building policy where uh, any public building over 5,000 square feet is required to be LEED certified. And in addition to that, it was the first U.S. state to adopt the same policy, and this was back in 2000, so quite a while ago. Now, a green building at CKC. First of all, who is CKC? Well, Kerry Kipsinski and Company. We are a uh, company that's based in Bellevue, Washington, just across uh, Lake Washington from Seattle, which in terms of distance is not all that far, but in terms of traffic, it seems a world apart. And um, so what is it that we do? Well, we're a purely structural engineering firm that uh, we design technically state-of-the-art, efficient, and cost-effective building structures throughout the country. Now, how do we do that? Well, we, um, we apply the, race, the, the latest uh, research and technology um, using the most advanced computer tools from both design, from a design perspective and also document uh, production perspective. And we also tend to uh, jump the code. Um, we jump ahead by, by looking at what's to come and seeing if we can implement it in our, in our designs. And we also understand construction techniques. Now, how do we do this? Well, we start by beginning um, by asking a lot of questions. We speak with rebar detailers, with placers, iron workers, suppliers, uh, formwork people, contractors, just to ensure that uh, whatever we're presenting on our drawings um, is not only meets their needs, but it's also easy to follow. So I mean, we make it easy for them, they make it easy for us. Now, we also try and meet with a contractor early in the project which means that, um, you know, provided one has already been selected, uh, just to discuss how they feel the building should be built so we can tailor our design to, the, to meet their needs. Now, th now, that could be anything from, you know, discussing whether it's going to be one lift at a time or two lifts at a time. If we're going to be looking at basement wall construction or the wall is going to go ahead of the slabs and slabs ahead of the wall. Th th those types of questions are definitely the ones that need to be answered. Now, we also um, need to communicate with the design team. So throughout the design process, we continually work with the design team to ensure that our design is incorporating their needs and definitely ours. We also consult with, uh, for instance, the soils engineer just to see um, you know, if, if it would be beneficial to use a site-specific response spectrum to get a more accurate description of the site itself rather than taking just code prescribed values. And then we also um, consult with the, um, with the architect to see if there are any modifications that we can make within the structure just to make it more efficient, not only structurally, but use a more efficient forming system to allow construction to progress a lot, more, a lot, a lot quicker. Now here, innovation at work. We're going to focus um, our attention on um, a project that's currently under construction in Seattle it's, uh, the, by the name of Escala. 
and it's the largest, or will be the largest residential building in Seattle upon completion in 2009. Now, when I say largest, I don't mean tallest, I mean largest in terms of floor plate. It has a 20,000 square foot floor plate, which for a residential building is, is uh, quite substantial. Now, it has uh, 31 stories above grade and eight stories below grade. So the eight stories below grade are obviously for parking, so it also means that it's one of the deepest holes in, in the history of Seattle. Um, at 90 feet, it's just behind the Columbia Tower that was built, you know, quite quite some time ago. Now, um, how how did we contribute to green design during um, the you know for this project? Well, we're going to look at forming systems. We're going to look at high strength concrete and where it was used, high strength rebar and where that was used, and some foundation detail. Now, um, just to begin, the uh, column hung forming system. Now, um, this system was ultimately chosen because it, it seemed to provide the, the greatest increase in produ production efficiency over any other conventional method. Now the contractor and owner were mostly concerned with the construction schedule and they, we work, they worked very closely with CKC uh, prior to hiring a, a, a production architect to ensure that this, the chosen system would work. Now it's um, you know, just to make sure that the architect doesn't come around and start changing things and making a mess. Now the um, the column hung system is nothing new. It's been used um, uh, um, in, in cities like Las Vegas with great success. And these pictures here um, represent uh, the MGM city center in Las Vegas, where if you look very closely, you can see up at the top um, portions of the structure where the column, the, the column hung system is, is being used. Now, the major advantages of the column hung system is that we eliminate all reshoring. Now, how is that achieved? It's achieved through actually using the building columns as a support system for the, for the, for the for, former. So, um, what we end up looking at here is we, have, we end up eliminating the reshoring and um, just to vi try and visualize getting rid of all those, um, that forest of uh, LS post shores that you see in these pictures. That also leads to improving um, the production efficiency. Now, this is another building within Seattle where the system was, was used. I mean, the, the reason I'm not showing it in Scala is because they haven't gotten up, you know, up high enough in order for that system to be used. But here we can see um, at, at the upper levels where, where the system is viewed and, and you know, you know, there's, there's um, no reshoring whatsoever. Plus it also allows the finished work to, um, to move, move, move along much quicker. But there is, um, there is a caveat. This is a, an example, this is a, flo a floor plate layout of a typical residential level in uh, the Escala project. It also shows that we, need, we definitely need a uh, regular column and wall grid system because otherwise the, uh, the column hung system is not gonna work. Everything has to be aligned with each other. There can be slight offsets that can be accommodated by the forming system, but otherwise it, 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 has to, it has to fit this model in order to be um, efficient. Now, how does the column system work? Well, let's, let's take it a look at it a, a step at a time. So on day one, the columns are set and poured. Day two, the tables are flown in while the columns are, uh, forms are stripped and the column jacks are installed. Now, for those, for those of you that are interested in what the column jacks look like, there's a blow up of it. So it's bolted to the column and then um, there are two uh, channel brackets that, that stick out where there's a post that comes and slides in between and that provides the adjustability. So that's where the tables come and set, set, um, sit on. Now on day three, the rebar and the PT work begins. Now in, in, um, in, the, in the Pacific Northwest, well, the, it's not just the slabs, but it's also the, um, the columns and the walls that are, the, particularly the columns and the walls that are the most time consuming. So in, in um, this, this, what I'm presenting here is a six day cycle, but in, in other areas of the country where we, where we don't have all the seismic detailing and uh, reinforcing requirements, it can be um, knocked down to about a three-day cycle. Here we're also going through uh, sleeving and roughing in for MEP. Now this is um, specific to residential projects where there is electrical, there may be plumbing, and there may be in-slab in ducting that all needs to be coordinated, preferably beforehand rather than in the field. And on day five, we have the, um, uh, the final buttoning up of, of all the in-slab elements plus the rebar and the PT. And, it, and in this picture, you can see that the, the forms for the columns are already being set. That's getting, getting prepared for the next lift. And then finally, in the sixth day, we have our concrete pour. Now, high-strength concrete. Um, 
that's defined by the Portland Cement Association as concrete uh, with um, a compressive strength of uh, 7,250 psi or greater, whereas in some other jurisdictions it's defined as anything uh, 6,000 or greater. But nevertheless, it's, it is what it is. Now, how, how is it that we achieve high strength concrete? Well, first of all, we start with a low water to cement ratio. And um, because not, not much water is needed to hydrate the cement, but um, the rest, the, the, rain, the rain, remainder of it is, is um, definitely needed for workability. So that's where our water reducing admixtures come into play. So that we can reduce the amount of water and then um, still have, um, you know, still, the concrete still be able to be workable. Also the use of porcelains is very important. These are the uh, mineral admixtures that can be used either as cement replacement, but they are, are mainly used to increase strength or reduce permeability. And they can be anything from fly ash, which mo most, most people are, are familiar with, to silica fume or, or furnace fire. Now, uh, high strength concrete also allows us um, to use concrete more efficiently, leading to uh, smaller structural, structural elements and um, greater, greater free space. So what we're essentially doing, is, at least for vertical elements, is um, really using concrete um, at, uh, for its greatest strength, if you will. So, which is in compression. So we can um, we can make the element smaller. We can actually pull some steel out, which means that you're not not only are you saving on material, but you're also saving on labor. So there we go with the uh, reduction in vertical steel. And also, it, um, high strength concrete did have quite a quite quite successful use prior to 1994, as can be seen in this co this comparison of cities from Seattle to Atlanta to uh, Cleveland and uh, to Chicago. Um, well, Seattle being the, the clear winner with uh, uh, the couple buildings with 19,000 PSI. Now, the reason I say that this was successful use of prior to 1994 is because of Northridge, the Northridge earthquake in Southern California, the uh, detailing requirements changed such that we ended up with things like this. So how is it that we can actually improve uh, quality of uh, construction um, just by maybe using high-strength high uh, high rebar. Now what this, um, what this graph represents is the light blue line rep represents standard uh, grade 60 rebar that has a very well-defined yield plateau. Now the dark blue represents uh, 100, uh, new 100 grade uh, rebar where it actually continues to gain strength after the yield point. It doesn't really have a very well-defined yield point, yet beyond that it just gains strength. Now in high seismic zones, Obviously, grade 60 is, is the material of choice for any, any, any element that's going to be resisting um, any lateral force because, because of the ductility. Yet, there is one particular element in both walls and columns that is very well suited for, for, the, for the grade 100 um, rebar because of the increase in strength. And that goes for, um, if you can see in this column section, it goes for the, um, for the hoops and ties. Now, those, the, the intent for the hoops and ties is, is to um, prevent the vertical elements within um, either be it, be it a wall or a column the, of uh, buckling. So, and, um, so what, ha what happens there is that um, we, with the higher strength rebar, since, since the, the, uh, the design of the, the, uh, the ties and the hoops is a function of concrete strength, where me meaning that if you have a higher concrete strength, you're also gonna have a tighter spacing on the ties or a larger bar or combination of the two. So what, with a higher strength rebar, that allows us to um, increase the spacing, maybe relieving uh, reinforcement congestion. So that uh, definitely is a step in the right direction. And it also reduces steel tonnage because rather than using grade 60, we're using grade 100. So there, there is a 40% reduction in, uh, in tie steel. And it also improves quality, just like the um, picture I showed previously. The, um, the concrete consolidation in heavily congested areas is, 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 is something that um, you know, contractors always have a problem with. So in the, by increasing the spacing, then we, we definitely are, are alleviating the problem. And it increases, it increases efficiency, so that means that this, since these are elements that might even be on the critical path and are definitely some of the most difficult pieces to install, um, we're, we're um, allowing the project to move forward at a much faster pace. And it also saved the scala 230 tons in seismic uh, confinement alone. However, we still haven't yet, we have yet to quantify exactly how much time, time and labor was, was saved because of it. And here's a, an example of um, a head-to-head -head comparison between grade 60 and grade 100. 
whereas one actually has a lot more space than the other. And there was also, there, there was also a little tidbit of info is that the iron workers tended to complain that they couldn't fit their boot between, these, uh, between the ties in order to scale the, the, uh, the column cages. So obviously with, uh, with the 100 grade steel, they, they, they won't have that problem anymore. Now moving on to um, foundation detailing. Well, going back um, to the communication side of team collaboration, um, many times we'll, we'll approach the soils engineer with, um, you know, for, for them to provide us with a much more accurate description of the soil. So then we, we uh, um, ask for a site-specific soil um, information, where on the graph that you see before you, the red represents the site-specific, whereas the, um, I believe it's uh, black. Well, the topmost represents the uh, code prescribed. So obviously there's, there's quite a difference between one and the other. So it's preferable, in, in, in definitely in a high seismic zone, to use the uh, site-specific data because it's definitely more representative of, of what we have, rather than just a generalized approach. We also use um, high-strength rebar uh, within the foundation mats, and this um, we, we, we typically use grade 75 rather than grade 60 because that allows us to have a 20% reduction in steel tonnage. In addition to that, we typically specify either number 11 or number 9 or a combination of the two, never in the same layer or, the, or, or you know, either, either at the bottom or the top. And that also uh, allows for uh, increased production efficiency while on the site. Now this, this is a new trick that, um, that we've started using. Now um, using the support bar or standees uh, as either a, replace, uh, either a full replacement or just, um, you know, just to reduce the amount of shear reinforcing that we have within deep foundation mats. So if, this, if the reinforcing is going to be there anyway, why not use it for a structural purpose? Now, in some other projects, we've also used the top mat of, um, or the top of, of the foundation mat as the parking wearing surface, particularly where we have subgrade parking. And this uh, definitely saves uh, time, money, and materials for, you know, for, for precluding the, the, the need for, a, for a, an additional top wearing surface for the parking. So all these ideas lead to reductions in labor materials and time. And there's a, a, a picture, another picture, let's say a blow up of the interior of the uh, foundation at, at Escal, where it's, it's easy, I mean, there, there is no shear reinforcing. So we've, we've uh, in this area, we've, we've uh, replaced it with the, uh, the standees or, or just the, the top bar support, support. Now in closing, um, I'd just like to mention that engineers can definitely be green. Now, how, how is it that they can be green? Well, it would be through early involvement. Early, early involvement means that our input at the early stages of any project can have a profound effect on uh, both materials and labor efficiencies during, well, before, during, and after construction. We also have to keep current with the latest technology and research. Uh, because there's always more than one way to skin a cat, so we definitely need to, to um, uh, keep, uh, keep as current as possible to ma make sure we're incorporating the latest and the greatest in our design. And open communication with the design team. There, uh, just ne never really take um, the information as is, always ask questions, because it may be that uh, another team member hasn't really thought or considered a particular alternative that may just increase the efficiency of the project and be, uh, you know, overall, be an overall benefit. And that just, that ties into uh, team collaboration. Now here, um, you know, it's uh, the collaboration between all design team members is instrumental in the um, ultimate success of a project. So, you know, just as many people have used in the past, there is no I in team. Now green building is definitely here for good. All these logos that are, that are popping up are just a handful of the organizations, both public and private, within the you know, city of Seattle and the greater Puget Sound region that are de dedicated to promoting, informing, teaching, and, and teaching the, the general public about green building and just how a few modifications to our daily routine, our daily lives, can, just, can, can lead to a much more sustainable community. Now this graph um, was uh, published by the U.S. Green Building Council just, uh, you know, just a few years ago. And um, it illustrates that uh, the green building will definitely continue to rise in both the residential and commercial sector. Now, as a, um, as a final note, I'd just like to uh, leave you with this, that uh, lack of team collaboration can have disastrous results. Thank you.